I'm going to call to order the special meeting of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority, or actually, it's a special workshop of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Um, today is Wednesday, May 8th. It's a little bit after 1 o'clock, so I say, what the heck, let's get started. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, could we have a roll call, please? Supervisor Parker? Here. Supervisor Phillips? Supervisor Adams? Here. Councilmember John Gagliotti. Here. Councilmember Frank O'Connell. Mayor Pro Tem Gail Morton. Here. Councilmember Hoffa. Here. Mayor Ian Oglesby. Councilmember John Wizard. Mayor Marianne Carbone. Here. Mayor Joe Gunter. Councilmember Cynthia Garfield. Councilmember Jan Reimers. Kathleen Lee. Nicole Hollingsworth, Erica Parker, Debbie Hale, Here. Dr. P.K. Diffenbaugh, Steve Matarazzo, Dr. Lawrence Samuels, Here. Colonel Ford, Here. Bill Collins, David Martin, Here. Lisa Reihiner, and Dr. Matt Zefferman. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen Lee, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Are there any acknowledgments, announcements, or correspondence that we should take note of? Okay, thank you. We'll move next to the public comment period. Any member of the public who would like to comment on any items not on today's agenda are welcome to do so at this time. Is there anyone with comments? Good, because I don't know where you'd make them. All right, um, we'll close public comment period and we'll move to the business of the day. Mr. Hulamart, are you going to yes, Chair. shepherd us through this? Uh, yes, the board asked for a special workshop that would allow the board members to have an opportunity to engage. So we tried to put our tables together in a way that's a little more engaging than in the past. And to do this with representatives from the administrative committee, which they're right behind, not sitting as the administrative committee, but here to be a part of the process. And the idea would be to have an exchange that went between members here as well as the members of the administrative committee and members of the community do it in a workshop kind of fashion and relatively informal. You ask for facilitation, you are gonna get two facilitators. Neither of us may be what you wanted. <laughs> One is your executive officer, the other is Kendall Flint. Kendall, of course, is Director of Communications for RGS, and she's a better facilitator than I am. But I'm going to start off a little bit to kind of give everybody an idea of what we're going to try to do today. First, I'd like to make sure everybody's taken a look at the agenda and recognizes that the two things we're going to focus on today have to do with our capital improvement program and our 2018 transition plan. And I think everyone has commented about the fact that there's an, a significant amount of overlap between the two, sometimes creates a little bit of confusion amongst members of the public or the members of the board, sometimes the forest staff. It happens all over. So in, instead of trying to go through and give you a bunch of talking heads that just goes through the process, we're going to get supplemented and, and helped by PowerPoint presentations. But as we go through, if there's an item or something that comes up, you know, let, raise your hand and let's try to talk it through at the time so that we kind of do this workshop format in a way that gives everybody an opportunity to really absorb, consume, and then be able to translate in the actions that will be coming up in the next weeks, days, 90 days, months, whatever it takes. So 
That's an introduction of kind of how we'd like to informally move through the day. Second part of that is, oh, thank you, Authority Council, for joining us. Uh, so, <laughs> Jonathan Brinkman has put together a PowerPoint presentation that he has also provided over the last several months about the capital improvement program at administrative committee meetings. And several of the members thought this would be a valuable way for you to kind of get a, a, a handle on how the capital improvement program currently affixes today. It's about a 20-year capital improvement program that started about 20 years ago. It goes for another decade, not because we're here for another decade, but because in terms of planning and looking at the obligations, we have to look at when they're required, when they would be in place with respect to developments and other things that are proposed and projected by the jurisdictions. So FORA follows form in that regard. The jurisdictions provide projections. We put those in the capital improvement program and then you'll see them come out on the other end with, as to when development provides funding for other capital improvements. So that's all gonna be the first part of what'll happen. Jonathan will take us through those pieces, the background, the purpose, what's gonna be the proposed this year, how, how that fits. You know, there's several questions that have come forward not necessarily what you read in the newspapers. I thought it was really curious that the last five things we've seen in the press this week were all confused. We saw one item that talked about all the bombs we had at Fort Ord. How many bombs have we had at Fort Ord, Mayor Oglesby? There's the answer. But the newspaper said that many, many were re removed. I think they really meant grenades. Um, so sometimes it could confuse folks. Um, we also had the news, yesterday I was watching television, and guess what? The County Board of Supervisors approved for his extension for two years. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> so that's just a couple of examples, but there's been four or five this week. And so my comment is, words matter. And how we use them matter. So in this session today, as Jonathan takes us through the CIP, talks about the future of the CIP, he'll kind of give you words and why they matter because a word that's called obligations might mean one thing to some, might mean something to someone else. So we go through the process. Then after that, Kendall is going to give us an update of where we are with our uh, transition plan, what its purpose is, the implementing agreements, and then one of us will mention a little bit about the legislation and, and where it is. Then, hopefully, and I'm going to one more time call upon our colleague, Vice Mayor Morton. She had an interesting and wonderful way of describing how these two things might fit again. She pointed out that we had the CIP on one side, we have the implementing agreements and the transition plan on the other, and they all have Thank you, Supervisor, you got it. <laughs> How do they fit together? <laughs> All right, so I think that's what we're gonna try to do today. Um, so I'll ask uh, Jonathan if he will proceed with the PowerPoint presentation on the CIP. And I guess if I could just ask, um, part of what I thought we were here to do was to understand the conversations that the admin committee has been having. I rather suspect that what you're gonna present is the result of those, but if you could uh, provide some context as we go, um, that, that would help me since I wasn't at the admin committee meetings. And I mean, I've, I look at the notes, but um, it, that would be helpful. Sure. Thank you. First slide. I think this is in the middle. Here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. All right. Got it. Okay. Uh, Chair Parker, members of the board, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present and start off on the, the workshop after um, Executive Officer Hulamart's lead off. Um, also, also um, take a pause after the CIP portion and uh, do the transition to the transition portion of uh, that of today's workshop where Kendall Flint uh, from RGS will take the mic and uh, we'll take hopefully at that pause answer any questions that are out there um, and then continue through the workshop um, of course the chair 
Um, appreciate you. If you have questions or uh, comments in the middle of this presentation, just let me know. Okay, about the four, so um, the parts of this um, presentation, um, we'll go over the four CIP background um, and then get into the draft 2019-20 um, CIP and the policy decisions that are before the board um, this Friday as, as that is presented. We also have um, a, a few slides about the future, a slide about the future of the CIP. Um, and then um, Kendall will be up on the transition plan status and then we'll have the side-by-side -side comparison. So uh, talking about forest for CIP, uh, we need to really start with um, the genesis of the CIP. So back in 1994 when the base was realigned, um, soldiers left. This property was was really used for the housing, the feeding, and the training and of soldiers, and also the important mission of the DoD. And what was needed was to have a plan that could convert this property over to civilian use, a, a civilian mission. And the legislation that created FORA in 1994 identified FORA would adopt a five-year CIP and a base reuse plan. So part of the base reuse plan was to create an operations and business plan. And that business plan included a pu public facilities implementation plan. That was for his first CIP. It identified the back, um, backbone infrastructure, let's see, uh, the backbone infrastructure that had sig service significance from water to sewer, um, identifying what would be the main transmission line needs for the development of the base, based on the base reuse plan um, growth projections. And there were two, uh, it included water and sewer, included the, the roadways, um, included um, the needs for water augmentation to, to build to that plan level. Um, and there were two time horizons that were studied in that, that first CIP. It was development through 2015, which is, as we know it today, the resource constrained base reuse plan, which we operate under, and then the ultimate build out. And that's more of the 40 to 60 year plan that was originally part of the base reuse plan and then later the adopted plan was just to the resource constrained level. Um, so that first CIP identified, well, how are we gonna pay for all these costs? Because you're looking at a base reuse plan that has 18,000 acres or two thirds preserved as habitat and roughly one third or 9,000 acres for economic development. Um, and you also have an institution, um, CSUMB, you have UC Santa Cruz, you have other property owners that um, have important mission with that development acreage as well. So how, how are you going to fund the infrastructure that's needed? Part of that financing plan was looking at, well, we have to do a pay-as-you-go process. We can use fees, imp impact fees, we can use co community facilities district fees, but the, the scenario that was realistic moving forward was that development would pay a large portion of the infrastructure needed for the base, to, to develop the base. Okay, so uh, how did we get to the annual CIPs after that base reuse plan, first CIP? Well, it started with um, the impacts on the base reuse plan, final in environmental impact report. Um, there was um, an impact for increased travel demand on the regional transportation system. Um, basically, it's, it talked about there being deficiencies on the regional traffic as because of growth on, within the plan area. So it would affect um, the roadway segments and the level of service would fall and congestion would occur uh, on Fort Ord and off, off of Fort Ord. So to um, have a mitigation for that impact, um, the plan called for a DRIMP, a development resource and management plan. And that was a mitigation measure for that impact is also a mitigation measure for um, the potable water supplies as well. Um, on the transportation side, it set up a fair share funding program. So four would fund its fair share of the roads within the base, that's the on-site roads, the roads that are off the base, typically um, county roads, and then the regional roadways, which were the Caltrans roadways, and the transit improvements. So four would pay its share, and um, completing that network would be that mitigation for the base reuse plan. And for a, 
annually updates its CIP to um, plan those, those proposed roadways and transit improvements. So the DRIMP also called for Ford to coordinate with TAMC. Um, we've adjusted the, and we've looked at the road uh, impacts, so we've monitored the service levels as required by the DRIMP. Um, 1997 was that first transportation study. 2005 was the second transportation study, and 2017 was the most recent one. And uh, just to note that in 2005, there was a shift. Um, the 1997 study included Ford's fair share equally on all three types, the on-site, the off-site, and the regional. In 2005, uh, the shift happened with the on-site projects. The board took on a policy of uh, funding um, the on-site roadways 100% of the way and took on a slightly a lesser amount of funding on the off-site and regional roadways to offset that. So also in the DRIMP, um, there's a measure here that says Ford is going to maintain an annual CIP. And that's to, um, on a first-come, first-served basis, extend the infrastructure as needed um, to the, the projects that are being um, pr proposed by the jurisdictions. And so since 2001, 2002, Ford has adopted an annual CIP um, with the exception of, I think, around 2004 during that transportation study um, for the 2005 study. There was no CIP adopted that year. Um, we also adopted a mid-year CIP in 2009. Other than that, each year we've had a, a CIP brought to the board and, and adopted. And we've worked uh, hand in glove with uh, the administrative committee, we've refined the process of development projections, um, especially during uh, the Great Re Recession uh, back around 2012 to 2013. The administrative committee set up a process of, of reviewing the projections, confirming those projections, um, sharing those with the board um, as part of this, the annual CIP. So this is um, Forest Capital Improvement Program. Um, we've accomplished a number of these um, program mitigations, uh, obligations, uh, including the storm drainage system. So we uh, retired that with an um, EDA grant to um, take out uh, the outfalls that were taking storm water into the bay. Um, we have also retired our firefighting enhancement. And then the water and wastewater collection has been turned over to Marina Coast Water District. So what really remains in the CIP for 2019-20 uh, are the transportation and transit, the water augmentation, the habitat management, and the building removal. So uh, these are just the list of our regional transportation projects in our CIP. Highway 1, um, Highway 1 interchange at Monterey Road, and then uh, Highway 156. And then the off-site projects include Davis Road, um, Reservation Road, Del Monte Boulevard Extension. And then the on-site transportation um, includes uh, these lo local roads that are within the, the boundaries of former Fort Ord, include Abrams Drive, 8th Street, Giggling, Salinas Avenue, General Jim, Moore Boulevard intersection at South Boundary, South Boundary Road, and then not um, funded in this um, interim CIP, are the Northeast Southwest Connector and Giggling Road. And that, um, we, I put those in a different color since they're not being proposed for funding in this interim CIP. They're pending the study that the board took a first vote on um, at, the, at the last four board meeting. Um, and that direction with that motion was to come back with the full CIP after the study's been completed. So we're bringing forward a CIP with transportation projects that are unaffected by that study. Um, there's, and so we can continue with the, the work that's needed in the CIP um, should the board approve this interim CIP. And then on the transit projects, we have uh, transit vehicle purchases and replacements and the intermodal corridors, inter intermodal centers. Um, that includes uh, some rideshare parking lots as well as an uh, intermodal center. Yes. We have a question. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Just could you explain why there's like two different uh, notations for giggling? Is that like giggling to seventh is the one that currently is being funded? And then 
some kind of an extension of giggling um, is the one that is pending? Or yes. could you explain why I, it is and isn't? I apologize for giggling being on there twice. That is a typo. Um, the, the black one should be deleted off the screen and just the blue one should remain. Madam Chair, just a, a quick question. Sure, Will ahead. the slide deck be available to us? Is it already up on the website? Okay, thank you. Okay, and then on the water augmentation projects, we have the RUOP um, pipeline. That's the recycled water project. Um, FORA has uh, funded a large portion of this already, and it's included in the CIP, um, this um, FY 1920 CIP, up to $1.6 million. And that would meet, uh, meet FORA's reimbursement agreement requirements with the Marina Coast Water District. And then we have a, a RUOP other project. That's the second water augmentation project, which is currently has a study underway with Marina Coast um, and partnership with FORA and Monterey One Water. Okay, then on the conserv habitat conservation plan, um, so the CIP provides funding for HCP preparation and also those endowments for the cooperative endowment, which is the largest one, um, which would be controlled by a future JPA board, and then the UC Fort Ord Natural Reserve Endowment, which would be controlled by, um, by UC for their habitat reserve on former Fort Ord. Okay, and then into the future of the CIP. So um, in the future, um, if the pending legislation SB um, 189 passes, um, the future of the CIP, there would be no CIP after that dis dissolution date of 2022 is currently proposed. Um, and then if there is no legislation, then it's, there would be no C CIP after for dissolution on June 30, 2020. So uh, in terms of the importance of the transport, um, transition planning, the, uh, the importance of meeting for CEQA obligations and turning over these large CIP items to the local agencies and jurisdictions, it makes this really uh, par of paramount importance to, to comply with CEQA and to turn these over before FOR's dissolution. And I'll pause there for questions, comments from the board. Are there any questions or comments on this portion? Yes, Mr. Hoffa. And then Ms. Morton. I'm sorry, do we have a, a list that, that the board could see of sort of all of the CEQA obligations that we need to check off and make sure there's an appropriate uh, recipient of before sunset? I think if we don't, we should have that. So, so to, to answer, the list would be in the CIP, those, so the transportation projects and transit projects that were described in this PowerPoint as well as the water augmentation. Those are the currently identified funding obligations that FORA has, and then the habitat is also uh, one of those requirements. Thank you. So, I, Jonathan, the list in the FORA CIP, and if you didn't bring your 1819, I guess we don't have the list in the packet. But the question that I have is that I would like to hear what the admin committee was addressing in this CIP as what is feasible in the CIP project. They, it's my understanding that they were taking, having discussion about what's feasible to get accomplished by FORA Sunset 2020 and two years with limited staff, limited resources, and they're not in the planning position, basically anymore is what's feasible by 2022. So it, I don't care if you go back to your list or if somebody from the admin committee would like to address that, but that would be important to us. Sure. Do you know? Uh, thank you. Um, Councilmember Morton, uh, Vice Pro Tem Morton, the, um, the admin committee, I will try to characterize what the admin committee discussion was and then colleagues please weigh in. The, um, as it related to the, the current 
the development of the current year's CIP process for the upcoming budget year CIP, um, the, the consensus on the board was that we should proceed with the um, process as, as it has existed in order to provide a recommendation to the board um, in time for adoption into the budget, which I believe is uh, next month, um, on the one hand. So that's the 1920 CIP. And on the other hand, as it relates to the future CIP, um, our discussions with our consultant team and amongst ourselves has, uh, I would generally characterize as agreement that regional, I'm sorry, re agreement that uh, local transportation projects should devolve to the jurisdictions for execution, whether that is in uh, 2020 or 2022. And our discussion has revolved mainly around what to do with the regional projects. And, and there have been, uh, what, I would, what I would say, there have been sort of the following points made. On the one hand, uh, a recognition that TAMC, as, as the regional transportation agency, ought to take over regional projects. Uh, and that a transition plan implementation agreement with TAMC ought to codify how that happens with a significant concern by, I would characterize as a, I believe a minority, but a significant minority of the committee, that fees collected in the fora area be retained for funding the regional projects on the fora CIP. Um, I think I'll stop there and open it to any, if, well, I'll, I'll stop there. May I ask a follow-up question, Madam Chair? So when you say that TAMC and I, that there's a divergence of city managers or representatives on the admin as to whether or not the collected fees from the fora area should remain to address the regional impacts of the, for which fora is responsible, those regional impacts would include Highway 1, Highway 68, uh, Davis Road, that it includes areas not just within the, the boundary of the former Ford. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I, I also just wanted to point out the administrative committee, when talking about transition planning with the on-site projects, there was some discussion. Um, would you take on the on-site projects in the jurisdictions? Said yes. Um, with a recommendation that for complete two of its lead agency projects being South Boundary Road and the intersection of General Jim Moore Boulevard with South Boundary Road. And then there was some debate on the EIR of the um, Northeast Southwest connector. Um, it wasn't unanimous on that, whether that should be funded or not and for CIP. Thank you, Mr. Wizard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I guess just for the sake of clarification, because I'm still kind of new, um, if if Fora if Fora sunsets on 2020 in on December or June 30th of 2020, um, and the the revenue generation piece disappears, if it, if it there's no more property tax, there's no more land sales, there's no more development fees, what happens to the CIP through 2030? What 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 mechanism funds that? Cities, yeah. your tax dollars, whatever you have, developer fees. But well, if it's for a CIP, then a city is not necessarily bound to it unless they accept the transition plan implement implementation agreement. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's that difficult to figure this out. That if a city wants to develop a project, they would have to do an environmental right. report. And they would have to, and I'm not sure if the same environmental requirements would proceed, but there certainly would be requirements that have to be funded either by the developer, which would be like through developer fees or through city underwriting it through taxes if the city wanted to do that. When you're able to and under what circumstances you'd be able to do that might be a little difficult. But you'd have to replace the funding for those projects, which are sequel mitigations, whether they be regional or local or otherwise. 
So the, the CEQA mitigation aspect is interesting because it's a, a CEQA mitigation to the base reuse plan. But if for it doesn't exist and the base reuse plan is not adopted through an implementation agreement, is it a requirement that a city or other land use jurisdiction pursue that CEQA mitigation? The mitigation doesn't change. It's based on projects. So if you're pursuing a project, the mitigation would remain. Okay. Regardless of the jurisdiction. No, that, that makes perfect sense. So I, I guess that, that was a question to ask my real question, which was, in our, in our last meeting, I was curious to know the relationship between talking about the CIP, doing a transportation study to determine what was um, most prudent and important, and all of those things cannot be separated from the implementation agreements. And well, I realize that I'm not the mayor of the city of Seaside, and I think we have a fine mayor, I do have a, a vote at this board, and I have yet to see a, even a draft of an implementation agreement. So I'm not sure how I'm supposed to blend an implementation agreement I haven't seen with the need to complete a CIP for this next year and potentially the, in perpetuity, since there may not be an opportunity to do another one, with the notion that some of these roads are in, some are out, some are locally funded. There's a, a preference by a body that is not this one to categorize these as on-site or off-site or funded and not funded. There, there's a lot of moving pieces, and I'm just trying to, trying to, trying to, to synthesize how all these these disparate threads fit together in the, in the context of this conversation. That, that is a, a wonderful description of why we're here today. <laughs> I, I, can't, I could not have said it. I don't think anyone could have said it better. Uh, and the, we're at the, the first end of it, which is the CIP, and then where the, the status of the implementing agreements and what they're going to look like is exactly what Kendall Flint is about to say. And then we kind of, at the end, want to address specifically that question. How do those all fit together? That's really what I... You're right on target. May I ask a question of the director that's, um, Mr. Wizard, when you are using the word implementation agreements, all, your city has an implementation agreement. We have an implementation agreement. The county does. Is that the document you're referring to, or are you referring to the transition plan implementing agreements that are yet, not yet written? Those are two distinct different things because you already have contractual obligations under an implementation agreement, and as our transition plan discussions go back and forth, whether those are enforceable post FORA 2020 is a legal issue. And so I'm trying to understand where you are, to what you're referring for your questions, if you could help me. That's a great question, Director Morton. Uh, and I apologize for my, uh, for playing fast and loose with implementation and implementing, um, because I realize that they are different things. And so um, the short answer is, I forget which is which. Implementation <laughs> agreement is past history. The implementing agreement then is the one that I have questions about because I have yet to see it and I know that it affects this conversation. And so I was under the impression that it would help shape how productive this conversation could be to have that sooner. But I understand that we're going to get that all at the same time today. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you for asking. So um, maybe our authority council can correct me, but I th my understanding is we establish the CIP. The CIP then is our regional commitment to satisfy our CEQA obligations. If we decide we don't want to do some part of it or we can't afford to do some part of it, uh, then some part of it won't get done, you know? And so, in essence, the CIP determines what the implement, implementing uh, agreement should be. So you might, you, Seaside might decide we, we don't want to develop this particular part or we do want to develop it all, and so we need these roads or whatever. You could always choose not to do it all, right? <clears throat> but then the CIP is laying out kind of our regional goal to meet our CEQA. Each jurisdiction has, has to then decide for those, for those responsibilities within their jurisdiction which ones they actually want to do, and that would be part of the implementing agreements. If, they, if we don't do it all, they're going to have to either figure out some other way 
post fora to do a new EIR and figure out what their mitigations would be and how to fund them, or they just don't do that part of, of their plan. Is that correct? Am I understanding this correctly? Right. It, it's pretty close. I did want to add that not everything in the CIP is a CEQA requirement. For example, building removal is the board elected to do additional building removal. That's neither in CEQA nor is it included in the description that you get under state law which says what the capital improvement program should have in it. The board's elected to add those things. The, that. And, and so it seems like then our discussion should focus around what can we afford and what are our priorities and we all have our own priorities and so we also have to think about how can we compromise in order to all get as much of, as possible of what we want. We can't do it all, we know that. We, we never had enough money to do it all. Gail's pointed that out. And even if we go till 2022, we still won't get all of the entitled project money, and so that's less money. So we have to figure out how much have we really got, and then um, set our priorities and try to compromise with each other. That's the discussion. That's the discussion. Good. Yeah, I think this is, uh, and this is the, this uh, I think is sort of what the admin committee has been wrestling with all this time of trying to figure out what what could and should FORA do in its remaining time, wh whatever number of years that is, um, and then which then flows down into what needs to be in the implementing agreements, which we then have to negotiate between each other about how we're going to do what we're going to do and how we're going to pay for it and, and all of that. So, yeah, I think that's why Director Wizard was like, wait, <laughs> I'm missing a whole piece here that I need to figure out what I think should be in the CIP as opposed to, you know, in, in, the, in the current year or the, the coming year as opposed to further out years. So it's a, yes. Huh. Yeah, thank huh. you, Chair Parker. Um, the admin committee has not really wrestled with that because every year we are sending you forward our CIP recommendation. Thank you. All right, are we ready to move to the next chunk? Okay. Uh, so I'll just, have this one slide and I'll turn it over to uh, Kendall after this. Um, just to give a little context to our transition plan background. So the Authority Act, uh, as amended in 2012, uh, included a mandate for FORA to complete a transition plan to transfer its a assets and liabilities um, before, December, before the end of 2018. So we, uh, FORA staff, as you're well aware, has gone through a transition planning process process um, 2016, 17, and 18 primarily. Uh, the board approved the 2018 transition plan in December this last year. And that calls for a process of setting up these transition planning implementing agreements. And so uh, just uh, to keep it brief and summarized is that it's uh, these agreements are proposing that a jurisdiction would take on a given obligation or CEQA obligation a requirement that FORA has in its plate to, to complete. Um, and by agreement, they would take that on and thus FORA would have one less thing on its plate to accomplish. And this would be done repeatedly until there's nothing left on FORA's plate by the end of all the transition pl implementing agreements being signed. I'll hand this over to Kendall. Does anybody watch Fixer Upper? Okay. You're taller than me. Um, so yes, we are so excited about having this meeting. We've been wanting to do this for so long, and I'm just thrilled that the board is here so we can actually walk through some of these things, because uh, to Councilman Wizard's uh, comment, we can't write implementing agreements until you as a board give us a nod on some policy. Now, I want to be clear today, we are not asking for any votes. We're not going there. We are only having this as a discussion. But based on the feedback we get today, we think that it will help us better prepare these implementing agreements. So if you kind of see some, where we are, today is a workshop. 
Um, following the workshop and feedback that we get on Friday's meeting, um, we are in the process of actually drafting the implementing agreements. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the components of those in a moment. Um, we would then look to see what happens with the final legislation, because there's some things in the legislation that will specifically affect those implementing agreements. Things like um, the takeover for certain types of administrative and records keeping that will be blessed to, by the county whether they want it or not, as the legislation is written at this point in time. Uh, then once we get all that, we get, go back to you and you'll have final agreements uh, that we know your legal teams individually will have a great time running through and redlining. So that'll give us some time if we get those out June, July, so that we really don't have to rush at the end of this process, right? We want to make sure we get it together. And then once we get everybody's approval agreements, make whatever changes we need to make, this will come back before the full board for a blessing, we hope, in early winter. The sooner we can get to it, the better off we are. And then for our planning purposes, and I know there are different positions and different letters circulating in this room, for our purposes as your facilitation team, it's either 2020 or 2022. That's, that's sort of our marching orders. If something else happens, we'll all adapt, but right now these are the two paths we're looking at. So FORA currently has certain obligations that are part of its operation. Once FORA no longer exists, these functions flow to all of you as municipal agencies that have property within the FORA footprint. That's transportation, habitat, water augmentation, and of course the Army cleanup, the ESCA things. So right now, we've got two little roads. Um, one is that we have the turn at June 30th, 2020, and the other is that we have the turn at June 30th, 2022. I hope everyone appreciates the schoolhouse rock nod to our friend, I'm only a bill. I was, I was a kid of the 70s, what do you want? Um, right now, we only have SB 189. The previous other piece of legislation is basically in a two-year track, which makes it essentially off the table for our purposes or discussion today, and that was related to prevailing wage, which I know makes some folks very excited that, that is not part of our deal. So currently what we're looking at in these implementing agreements, and there are several types, the, the base agreement is basically between FORA and connected to Delroy Oaks, Marina, the city of Monterey, the city of Seaside, and the county of Monterey. So what we're trying to do here is take all of the functionality and all the responsibilities that FORA currently has that are still relevant and valid and required and then shift those over to the local agencies. And this has been predominantly the conversation we've had with our folks at the um, admin committee meeting. So what we're trying to do is move those things from the left column to the right column. So I'm gonna walk you through the various conversations we've had and then we'll take little stop breaks to have either nodding heads or screams and then we'll adjust accordingly. So local roads, this was one thing, and I'm gonna look over to my admin colleagues, um, they all agreed. So with, with local roads, that's those um, roads that are currently in the FORA CIP that are in a local jurisdiction, they said, yes, we will take those on ourselves. Now the, the, the impact of that means that as a local agency, you would either have to develop your own local impact fee for roads um, or find another funding mechanism. But you would no longer get any money from FORA, from the CFD, that would all be gone, right? So you would be doing that locally. And everyone was in agreement on that. With the proviso, and this is just at admin, that the South Boundary Road Project and General Jim Boulevard would be in the 2019-2020 CIP. That was a, whole, a total agreement. When we started talking about the Northwest Connector and the completion of that environmental document, we had a split decision. But nonetheless, this kind of, as far as the local roads go, that was pretty accurate. I'm looking at Dino, I think that was well done, okay. So when we look at these local roads, what it basically shows here are the various uh, positions of where these things are. And I think as uh, Jonathan mentioned, um, three of these projects, Giggling, uh, Inner Garrison, and Eucalyptus, those are currently not part of the CIP. They're on this list because it's sort of a player to be named later based on the board's action on Friday. If you choose to move forward with the um, transportation study, that may or may not show that these are requirements for mitigation. Um, that, again, would be coming back for you for a decision. But for the Implementing agreements at this point in time, they would not go into it. We would wait until we get either direction from the board or direction from um, environmental that we have to do that. Now, when we look at the offsite things, some of these that are offsite, uh, these theoretically would be going into TAMSI. These are county and also city marina. So again, in the agreements, in the implementing agreements, we would attach these projects to those jurisdictions. And I want to back up just slightly. 
every jurisdiction will see every other jurisdiction's implementing agreement. So when we get to the part where it says local roads, it will say these are going to marina, these are going to seaside, these are going to county, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone will know what's been covered and so we won't be leaving anything out. Now when it came to the regional projects, this got a little more exciting in terms of the discussion. So we have a number of regional projects here um, that currently are in, he was talking about earlier, they're currently in um, long-term CIP, not planned for building right now. And there's a couple questions here. One, uh, a couple of our city managers felt that when it came to regional fees, they wanted to make sure that those fees were only expended within the actual FORA footprint. And others had the position that we do have a number of connector roads, like actually this morning, Steve and I came over 156. So that is still a regional connector to FORA, or this various area. So there's sort of a balance there. So the question was, what do we do with these projects? Do we transition them to TAMSI, which has already developed a um, strategy for capturing impact fees for regional projects, or do we come up with another mechanism? There's a complication on this one as well, because FORA, being a community facilities district, has a different criteria for setting the amount of money they take in on those fees, right? So when we transition over for MST, um, they're going to be receiving less money under a FORA to TAMSI plan than they would if it was continued with FORA. In our discussions with the TAMSI staff, They've indicated that while they are a nexus base, meaning they have to prove the, um, the reason you have that amount of money, that they, or the amount that you're charging, they would be able to take a look at potentially modifying that to increase those revenues and or assist on that to, to get it, make them whole, basically. But I want to be clear, they will never be the same amount of money. It will be less because of the way that the fees are collected, and legally that's the way it is. So not happy about it, but there you go. Now, the three options, and I'm going to pause here to get your feedback, the three options as we see it, either we transition all regional projects through implementing agreements to TAMC effective July 1, 2020, or we transition to TAMC uh, June, or sorry, July 1, 2022, or you transition to local agencies. And that would mean that the local agencies that are connected in these different projects would have to come up with memorandum of understanding or joint powers authority or some other way to deliver that project. Um, given where a lot of these places are, that's going to be a, pretty, a big lift on the county, to be honest. That's probably where most of those things are going to go. So of these three, we feel like these are really the only three realistic options before you. Um, and we would definitely like to hear your questions, concerns, and comments um, regarding that particular item. Okay, so you want Debbie, to Debbie, did you want to, sorry. Sorry, just, just on, the, on the, the regional roads, the Highway 1, the Highway 156. Yeah, I think so, and you know, as Michael those. said, we're going to kind of keep this a little bit um, sure. loose, but I don't think, and unless, unless someone wants to raise their hand and tell me different, I don't think anybody is disagreeing with the idea of transitioning local projects to the local agencies. Everybody seems to be on board with that. The question now is the regional project. So mm -hmm. what I'm really looking for is a discussion about how this plays out. And actually, before I do that, I would like to have Debbie Hale weigh in a bit sure. because we have had talks about this and kind of explain the difference between their fee collection system and some of the options that are before you. Debbie. Thank you, Kendall. I just wanted to clarify that <clears throat> because TAMC's fee is nexus-based, we can set a ceiling on it. Um, I think what uh, but and and we can also you know take it down lower than than the, the nexus study shows. Uh, but one of the things that doesn't fit very well into the nexus study is transit projects. And so when she was talking about an adjustment to put the transit projects in there, uh, that could be done within the fee program. If we were talking about an adjustment to make the regional project fees overall higher, that that could not be done. Um, and so that that's what I just wanted to to clarify on it and. Um, the other thing that I, I think um, is maybe a variation on, on what your option was, but what the TMC board has set up as the option is to actually just make the Fora zone subject to the current countywide impact fee program, which, although it has a list of projects that's longer than just the Fora list, is um, in many ways been administered on a zone by zone basis. So the projects um, uh, might be slightly different um, 
but not, but, but it in, encompasses the, the list that we're looking at here, um, with the one exception of the Highway 1 Monterey Road project. So there are some slight differences with regards to how the projects are addressed if um, the option one were, were taken. Okay. Madam Chairman? I'd see, did you have a question, question or comment? I was just wondering what happens to Monterey Road? There's a couple of different options because that's um, in the city of Seaside and it's in the regional modeling analysis. The traffic came in based on development within the city of Seaside that could be developed to a city of Seaside fee program like the other city projects. It could be that the Tamsi board decided that they did want to put it in the program um, and take a look uh, at it from the nexus basis. As th Those are two different options. So you're saying that it could it could just be essentially Seaside's responsibility or we could broaden it um, and have some participation, fee participation from other um, jurisdictions or areas because it's a, a regional road. I guess I'm just not understanding why it wouldn't just fit in. It, it's the one project that's not, it's not currently in the TAMC fee program. And so we would have to add it into the TAMC fee program and take a look at what would be the share of the usage of that interchange from other areas, just like we do for any of the projects. And I think it's important to, to mention that TAMC will be starting their regional transportation planning process, which is an opportunity to look at all of these all kinds of projects, not just in the four footprint, but countywide, and that's part of their function. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that, and other agencies have done this, you can have a project where multiple jurisdictions form a joint powers authority to, to fund certain aspects of it augmented by regional fees. There, as most of you know, there are many colors of money required to deliver transportation projects. So, um, other questions? I Thank you. I, I, I get it now. Okay. So, um, Director Oglesby and then oh, Director Morton. I'll be quick. Many colors of money. I'll take the green color. <laughs> right. But I, I, I think uh, Monterey Road is a regional road. And so, naturally, I would think that the uh, forward board would ask for that to be in, underneath Tamsi's uh, uh, banner, uh, like the other regional roads. I think all of the regional roads are in someone's jurisdiction. And so uh, let's not just uh, say that's in Seaside's jurisdiction. It's a regional obligation. It should be looked at that way. So I appreciate your concern. Okay. So you made me think of an additional question I want to ask. Is this overpass out here at Imgen Regional? Anybody know? Is it, well, uh, Debbie will probably it, know. Imgen is in the TAMSI um, Regional Impact Fee it Program. Is the overpass um, here. Not the overpass, just the roadway is. So that's Yeah, not we're doing the road currently to four lanes. Right. I understand that. I'm, my question is more directed about. Highway 1 and Imgen intersection was looked at in one of the prior four uh, analyses. Um, I believe it was two analyses ago, 2005. Um, it, but it was not, uh, it was decided not to put it into the fee program. So then my next question, um, Debbie, is on this list as A and B, and I get that the years are when for a, if the extension is granted, but is this option A that we're able to transition the regional roads to Tamsi June 30th, 2020? Even if the fora is extended to 2022, Tamsi would be prepared to take on that obligation forthwith. So under our, our yes, in certain conditions. Okay. Um, because right now, uh, if there were interests on the part of the Tamsi board in adding new projects into the fee program, then that would have to wait until our next update of the fee program, which is, I don't know, five years from when we. Yeah, yeah. 20, so so it would be closer to the 2022 for that. Um, but if um, uh, wanted to just uh, add it on and apply it as, as the countywide impact fee is, TMC could activate the FORA zone by, by June 2020. And so if, in fact, TMC was to implement as of June 30th, 2020, the existing regional road projects that are in the TMC scope, is it feasible by 2022 if 
for us here or not, that, for example, Monterey Road, maybe the overpass, anything else can be added into that, considered and added. Yes, yes, and we, so we try to do that every fee up to update. We could consider adding transit projects, um, adding in any additional projects that people felt were regional impact, and we do the analysis on that. So we could do it 2020, but still having the feasibility of additional projects being assumed by TAMSI as fitting your criteria, TAMSI's criteria for regional roads when the next study occurred in 2022. Yes. Thank you. I just want to point out there are some pros and cons on both of those. Um, your CFD, let's say it goes to 2022, which I think it will, but just based on what I know right now, um, you would continue to collect those fees, right? But if, if, you, if you shift the burden of those uh, regional projects to TAMSI, right, that is less things that go in your capital improvement plan going forward. I think that was one of the things that Jonathan was mentioning. As we offload these things through the implementing agreements, then the FORA staff, the, FORA, the things that FORA does shrinks as well. And then there's, we'll talk about that in a minute as it relates to the HCP, but there are some reasons for that. Just to follow up to that yep. statement. So if in fact we're reducing our obligations in the CIP, I get we're offloading those, mm -hmm. are we still collecting what's currently 24,000 per residential unit and then we're freeing up funds to fund our HCP, to fund Monterey Road, uh, the, the things so, that we've, not Monterey Road, yes. but South yes. Boundary Road. Yes. So, we're, yes. so we are more apt then to be able to meet the obligations that we're struggling with. I, I think I'd ask you to hold that thought for okay, like three you. more slides because I think you're going to see it, what's, what's available there. Um, and again, we'll come back and talk about this more, but before I move on from regional projects, um, yes, Hans. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this discussion uh, reflects some of the wrestling we actually had in the administrative committee. And, and I just note that, that Mayor Oglesby and Councilmember Morton are two for all with Tamsi on Monterey Road and Highway 1 Imgen Overpass, uh, where you heard from uh, Debbie, yes, it's feasible, but um, that means uh, it's also maybe not feasible. And that's where, where um, I uh, feel that uh, the fora um, area should have preferential treatment with respect to, to the projects that you just mentioned, Monterey Road, uh, Imgen uh, Overpass. Uh, right now, you put your fate into the hands of a regional operating board that has issues and challenges in South County as well. And you hope that somehow, somewhere, uh, the board comes through and says, yeah, Monterey Road is interesting for us. We want to do something there. And that's where, where, we, where we wrestled in the, in the, uh, in the, on the board uh, that TAMSI, of course, is, is an excellent partner in this and that it's no disrespect to, to TAMSI. But in the current configuration, you have, we have as jurisdictions, a better authority over transportation project than if we have to go through a regional board that may have topics du jour that, that are interesting for them and that have nothing to do with our economic development in Marina, Seaside, Monterey, Delray Oaks, and the county. Thank you. Um, Director Hoffa? So, um I guess I have an idea of how I could see kind of a pathway forward for this particular question, which would be, what if we were to look at the percentage of the base reuse plan that is completed, either by 2020 or 2022? We use that percentage basically to prorate what we can afford to pay TAMC and MST. So let's say we've completed, I don't know, 35% of the base reuse plan, and let's say we owe between the two agencies, I don't know, 50 million. And we, we obviously we can't pay it all. We can't do it all because we haven't developed it all. So we pay them uh, a prorated portion based on how much has been developed. And then the remaining portion would be made up um, by them through the nexus, the nexus fees. And it is true, as Han says, you know, at, at the point we transfer the responsibility, we lose some authority over which projects 
get done first. But possibly we could discuss which ones of those regional ones are most important, and maybe that could be part of our agreement with uh, TAMSI. I don't know, just a thought. Great, I guess, um, yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, yes, Director Oglesby. Uh, just, just quickly, that's, <clears throat> I want to say I appreciate Hans for weighing in. That's exactly why we asked the admin uh, group to be here to see, hear some of our thoughts and, uh, and to give us that background information. And, you know, I, I stand by the, the regionalness of the Monterey Road, but if that means we have to go battle underneath what TAMC is doing, and they have priorities, and we're, you know, when we meet a, underneath TAMC, I have to look regionally, you know, and I just can't pull out Monterey because it's in my backyard. I don't, I don't do that. I look regionally. So I appreciate his comments because we both have to think about what do we want to prioritize in, in our neck of uh, the former Fort Ord. So I, I thank Hans for that. Thank you. And I will say, too, as so someone who's um, sat on TAMSI for a while, uh, that in the discussions at the TAMSI board, um, there is often uh, the recognition that there are people who've been waiting their turn or uh, that sort of thing where something may get moved uh, into a priority position and the board is asked to think about it um, in a way that's not just uh, kind of everybody evenly. So I don't know if that would happen in this case, but I imagine that the, the Fort Ord situation is one that people throughout the county are aware of. And if there were uh, priorities that, um, you know, that this board wanted to ask the TAMSI board to look at with special consideration, it would be in, you know, we have time before the next um, fee discussion happens um, to sort of see where we are and, and, to, and to do that. I don't know if it would work. I mean, it, it is one of those things that it's, it's, it's not up to us, but um, the board tends to be pretty, um, you know, they, they like to be flexible and take these kinds of things into consideration um, as, as they can. So just something to keep in mind. Um, all right, so do, do you want us to come up with, uh, do you want us all to sort of well, weigh in here, on here's this? Here's what or? I'd like. Um, again, we're not voting. We're, we're just snapshot of the room. Um, does anybody have heart palpitations with the idea of transitioning to TAMSI as opposed to the county? Because really those are our only, or local agencies. Are we, as a board, do you see that, that with we have to work out the finances, these projects, there's still some things to go, but does anybody have a fundamental problem with, with transition to TAMSI? So I would suggest, if based on that, and again, you're still going to need to react to something specific, but I was very intrigued by what um, Councilman Hoppe said, that if we can take a look at the funds that are already in and perhaps work something within the agreement that prioritizes some of these things, we can work with TAMC staff to see if we might be able to come up with something and then bring that back to the board for you guys to take a look and bless it. Um, the only other question that I had in general, but I don't think we have to take action on this today, is we'll write the agreement that has two ways to go a June 30, 2020, and a June 30, 2022. And at the time we go through those, we can, we can discuss that at that point. But I think that makes some sense. Um, and I think, too, we'll look for ways to adapt language in TAMSI's um, piece that will also identify a commitment for um, MST to take a look at transit services and how that's going to happen. So we want to be as specific on this stuff as possible so it's not left up to chance, right? So if there are specific projects that we need to talk about, we want to do that. Okay. Thank you. And I think, you know, thinking about the reason to um, delay tra transitioning to TAMSI, if the, if the reason is to be able to direct more funds to, say, Monterey Road or, you know, something, um, our ability to make any significant impact on that is severely limited. So I just think we need to be realistic about, uh, about that and maybe figure out where we want sure. to put our energy because, um, uh, yeah, anyway. Just well, we're, we're going to get to the 400-pound you know, big issue thing here in just a second here. So right. here we go. Um, now we're talking about water. Now, water actually turned out to be one of the um, more pleasant conversations that we had. There's definitely some, some concern about things. I think the entire admin committee was in agreement that the lawsuits will be flying at some point, point. Um, and that's just what's going to happen. But we aren't basing our... 
um, tra implementing agreements on the, the potential litigation, right? We're basing it on what is the function of providing water, wastewater, all these kind of services. So MCWD has stepped up. They have actually provided copies of a draft agreement to all of your admin staff, and I believe that circulated to all the cities at this point, and as well as some of the other um, ex officio numbers. So the idea here is that in that case, the implementing agreements would actually be between MCWD and the agencies. Now, where, where we've stepped in on that is make it what we heard from many of you was a concern about um, memorializing and agreeing to provide the amount of water that was promised in the original four agreements. So if you look in the agreements with MCWD, you will see a table. These are the same water allocations that were in the initial uh, agreement, uh, which for each control, as well as recycled allocations. Now, the Army has approximately, I want to say, 1,000 acre feet that may or may not come into play later. Um, the way that this would work, FORA has first right of ref refusal as long as FORA is there. But if FORA is no longer there, then that first right of refusal potentially would flow to those other agencies, and we are working with MCWD to come up with a uh, language to talk about what that might look like, and it would likely be based on the same percentages of allocation that are already seen in these charts, right? So you kind of, if it comes up, although we've been talking about it, we don't think that's actually going to come up at this point. But the idea here is that MCWD would um, provide water, provide that level of acre footage. Now the agreements say that if perchance the aquifers are in fact impacted and there aren't, isn't enough money, that they will utilize alternative sources to get that water and provide it to your folks first before bringing on other um, users of water. And I, I know we have our GM today. Did you want to address that just very briefly so you can let them know kind of what the plan is? Uh, thanks, Kendall. Uh, actually, I think you got it correct that uh, the agreements really talked about the fact that there's allocations that we are honoring and that we are committing to develop the supplies necessary to meet those allocations. And uh, there will be some challenges, we believe, coming up with regard to sustainable groundwater management or other uh, issues. But uh, we believe that we have the capability to develop the supplies through both our groundwater and wastewater rights to meet those allocations. And so the agreements really reflect that that is the intention, that we're going to meet these allocations. I guess the caveat is provided that the projects are paid for, but that's also part of that agreement. Right, so the idea on this, again, is that as the, the rights of the water would, would flow from FORA to MCWD, with that agreement in place between FORA and MCWD that memorializes these numbers and keeps it, and then you would all get individual agreements with them as well. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, just as an aside, because I know this has also come up in a lot of our conversations, it is not lost on MCWD staff that its board is currently marina-centric. Um, but as they're annexing additional spaces, there will be opportunities for other people without, outside of the city marina to potentially sit on that board. There'll be opportunities, I think, also for several of the folks in this room uh, to serve ex officio. But we've been led to believe that there's going to be an open dialogue within the community and within the, the region in order to make this happen. Right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And maybe, okay. um, maybe, Mr. Vandermotten, you could talk about the timing of the annexation and when the expansion of the voting boundaries might happen. What's the timeline for some of that to happen? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. So LAFCO just recently unanimously, 9 approved our annexation application. And so a June meeting has been set for the finalization of the protest hearing. So as of that meeting in June, then LAFCO makes its final decision about the annexation. And that decision would be, need to be recorded within 30 days of that meeting in June. So we're within 60 days, I would guess, at this point of finalizing annexation, unless obviously there's a protest that requires that decision to go another route. But at this point, there's no reason to believe that's the case. And then once they're annexed, now um, the next vote, those that have been annexed will have the right to run for and vote for the board. Sounds good. Thank you. So 2020, the next, the next election, um, people from throughout the district can vote That's and run. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Mr. Hulamard, uh, Director O'Connell, and then Director Hoffa. Just a quick note that uh, Kendall mentioned the first right of refusal, we call it, but it, it, it's, it's like that. It's actually a coordination with the Army on 
fair share distribution of water, but that also includes uh, the wastewater provision. The Army retained 1.1 MGD of wastewater, and both that's for both water and wastewater. And the same process will go whatever Keith decides to design. I think that's what we're going to use for both, right? I'm sorry. Your question is as far as both wastewater and water, if those are allowed to be then reallocated. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we are addressing both. Yes. So from the Army perspective, we don't have excess water. I mean, very clear, there's no 1,000 acre feet, and your number is not the same number I'm tracking either up there, too. So um, I just want to make it very clear, the Army is not giving water away, period. Okay. That clears it up a lot for us. Thank we, you. Um, and fully we'll understood, Colonel. We'll, we'll double check those numbers from, from uh, the four um, folks. Okay. Is anything else? Well, sorry, we had a few more back here. Uh, to Keith, I was just wondering, is there been any discussion as to expanding and lodging the uh, board as a result of the annexation from five to seven example? There have been discussions. As a county water district, though, by law, we are a five-member board, and so we will remain five members, but now we will have a larger pool of voters, obviously, to run for those five seats. Thank you. And those will still be at large? Yes, they will be. Mm -hmm. Seats. All right, Director Hoffa. Uh, two questions. One, does Monterey Peninsula College have a water allocation? Because I don't see it up there. Is that in some reflected somewhere else? And then two, how much money does Marina Coast need in order to complete the water augmentation to meet all of that need? Oh, yeah. Sorry. To, to answer about Monterey Peninsula College, um, they were not granted an individual allocation. However, they have uh, an allocation by agreement with the county. I believe it's for 52 acre feet for the um, EVOC Center, the Emergency Vehicle Operation Training Center. That's also for the Mount facility as well. And uh, just was corrected. Also, they have an allocation from City of Marina to operate their satellite campus here. As far as the cost question, that is actually something we are studying right now. We're working on our master plans and uh, that number we're looking at. I think I'd like to say that whatever number we do come up with, there's still some big unknowns as far as the groundwater sustainability plans that are due. First one for the one subbasin in January of this year and the next one in two years. So I think based on how those go, that could impact the cost. But we don't, I don't have a number today that I think I would like to throw out there without actually finishing the study. Okay, thank you. And I would just suggest to the board that once we know that number, that should be a high priority because nothing else happens without water. If we don't have the water, we don't have the development, we don't have the need for the mitigation or the ability to pay for all of the other mitigation. So the water augmentation needs to be priority number one. All right, Director Wizard. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, before to, I get to my actual question, I just want to uh, agree with Council Member uh, Director Hoffa that, that if you don't have the water to build stuff, then you don't need the roads to get the people around. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, but uh, water is supremely important. Um, but to uh, Mr. Vandermotten, um, I don't know if you have the number you know, in the front of your mind, but do you have a, a guess as to the, geographic, the new geographic size of the district uh, following the annexation? Yeah, just a, just a guess as to. Yeah, I should know that number, it's, but I don't recall that number. It's off actually on the LAFCO agenda for your application. We can see if we pull it up. Okay. And it, 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 is it okay. you know maybe fifty to one hundred percent increase in size of the current geographic footprint? Population-wise, it's double, but I think uh, actual area-wise, it's more than double. I believe. Okay. I think it's yeah. I uh, I, I don't want to throw no, that, out a number. No, that's good enough. So. Um, I just makes me think a little bit more about uh, Chair Parker's question. Okay, so have we exhausted water with the understanding, again, that we're going to make sure that these agreements, of course, are working between FORA and MCWD and Hunts? Yes, please, Mr. Uslar. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, at the beginning of uh, her, Kendall's presentation about water, she said, we, we come now to the fun stuff where the lawsuits will happen. <laughs> and um, I paraphrase loosely, but I think that's what, what you said. So uh, what I think is um, 
and that's a very realistic uh, scenario that, that she describes. So I wonder if we are pursuing legislation with the help of the senator. Um, does it make sense to ask the senator to put provisions into the uh, SB 189 that says you shall not sue about the fora water allocation? Uh, the, it's okay if, if we are talking about uh, plundering and pillaging other water that is not part of the for a reuse plan to, to not have that privilege of not being sued. But what our jurisdictions will suffer if we do not try that at least is hundreds and millions of dollars of taxpayers' money uh, in trying to defend against those lawsuits. So I think uh, if the executive board uh, can consider thinking about a legislative solution that protects our water allocations from uh, frivolous lawsuits. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on from water to explosives. Um, <laughs> not bombs, mind you, but grenades. Um, and I want to just give a shout out to Michael, who provided me with my very own plastic grenade. Um, I had to remind myself to take it out of my carry-on bag flying to Southern California. Um, so currently, <laughs> Flora, this is basically a requirement. This is one of those interesting things that you all need to keep in mind. Whether four is here at 2020 or 2022, there is a requirement for that environmental, um, this ESCAP things to continue till 2028. That's not debatable, it has to happen. The Army has said that they are going to recognize only one agency to implement this particular t program. The city of Seaside has expressed a desire to do that. Uh, the board on Friday will be looking at a contract to extend the existing pool of three contractors that are currently providing services to support that. And currently, um, Forest staff has two, and Michael gave a quarter, Michael as well, two and a quarter staff members that fulfill this service. Now, the, the thing that we want to talk about here, just ever real briefly, the, um, this is not funded through your CFD or anything else. It's actually funded through an insurance program that works back with the Army. There's a reimbursement. So provided that we can uh, get that all signed off and the Army blesses Seaside as well as Department of Toxic Substances, then we can move Seaside into that role when they are ready to do so. Uh, the question really for the group is when should that take place? And that's kind of a, is it something we want to do now? Is it something we want to do a year from now? We also frankly have some questions for the Army staff to figure What's the timing for them to approve in that process to make sure that Seaside um, will get the nod to provide that service? So I don't know that there's really, um, I think everyone is in agreement that, that this will happen at some point. We've just got to figure out the logistics of it. In your implementing agreements, super important, in your implementing agreements, there will be language that ties your agency to compliance the same way that you were tied to FORA previously, and that you are tied to compliance, in this case, to Seaside. So if Seaside comes to your city or your county and says, we need access, whatever it is, you have to provide that. If they tell you you have to do a specific type of remediation, you have to do that. So those we worked in, and then there will be additional agreements between the city of Seaside and all of you. And I'm quite confident that our friend Sherry Damon will be working on that as well to make sure that those all happen. But the idea here is through 2028, the item you're going to hear on Friday is an extension of the contract to know that you've got competent people that know what they're doing to take out anything that might go boom and then move forward on for the next eight years. So any questions about that? Any concerns? Um, I just would suggest that we should strive to, ha first of all, thank you to Seaside. Really, we, um, this was something during the transition planning process. Nobody was really at that time willing to take this on. It's necessary that somebody do it and I just want to thank you. Um, but I think we should strive, if possible, to hand off in 20, June 2020 as many of these tasks as we can because we know that the board does not want, even if there is a successor agency, we do not want perceival obligations moving forward, if possible. Mm -hmm. We want a clean break in that regard. So I think we should, we should strive to work with Seaside and craft uh, an implementing agreement for this, if possible, to begin in June of 2020. Good. Yes, Director Martin. Um, so, Kendall referenced 
the fact that this is working off of uh, insurance funds. And in fact, I think our uh, executive director will affirm, no, we're not. That lapsed. We've completed the insurance policy. That's Almost. mostly correct. The insurance policy that provided the cost cap component of it expired on March 31st. There's a separate coverage, I think, that goes till 2022, but there's no payments associated right. with it. This is all under an amendment to our ESCA contract that the Army will reimburse FORA for the costs of the long-term stewardship through 2028. And that is the $6.8 million that a came little more. with that that we are yes. currently expending, but whatever the balance of those funds would transfer also to the city of Seaside. To reiterate, 99% correct, but it doesn't transfer. This is a reimbursement contract? Well, the right to collect transfers. You Sorry, I, it's yeah. semantics. But the other question is that I know this item got pulled last month from the board because we wanted Seaside to weigh in on the hiring of these, the extension of the contracts for services. And is the administrative cost component of the right to reimbursement under $6.8 million cover the cost of these three extensions, contract extensions, those services? Does that fit within that $6.8 million total reimbursement available? Absolutely. Perfect. So Seaside's protected. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Thank you. Yes. Um, we yes. worked very closely with the city manager on this process and provided him with all the documents and background, and he's reviewed it in detail. So is the board comfortable with, uh, oh, yes, uh, there he is now. Yes, yes. Mr. Malin. And, and, and I just wanted to uh, say for the board's comfort that the, at the staff level, uh, the city of Seaside is completely comfortable with uh, taking this on, and the action on the uh, board's agenda on Friday is of no concern uh, to the city of Seaside. We fully support it. Thank you. So is the board, so it's been proposed that uh, we aim to um, have this transition to Seaside happen by June 30th, 2020, what, sort of at the latest. So if it could happen sooner, that's good. I mean, these things take time. It seems like it should be a simple thing, and of course, that takes time. Well, I think time. once we nail the process of approval through the Army DTSC and the others, uh, there's some things that have to be set up. There's also sure. some personnel issues that my colleagues at RGS are working on as well. So I think it's feasible mm -hmm. that we could do it before, but I think the idea is we need to see what the plan in place would look like and then come back to you right. with the, on the HR side and kind of walk right. through that. We so is the out. board comfortable? Um, yes, uh, Director Oglesby. I'm comfortable. I want to pick up the thread where uh, Director Hoffa talked about uh, just signing some of these things way before, you know, when they're workable, way before uh, June 30th. That way this group has the ability, to, some type of oversight, you know, but if they're all are due on June 30th, 2020, and, and what is it, uh, on the 30th, 13 people walk out the room, and on, uh, what is it, July 1st, five people walk back, I don't want to be holding the bag. So I'll be here, but I don't want to be holding the bag. <laughs> so some of these things we should have the board be able to make sure it's, it's flowing smoothly. So we'll, you know, we'll leave the exact dates to the, the managers, but I'm just picking up his thread about, you know, get some of them done before we're out the room. Uh, thank you. All right. Anything else before we move to from the happy water to from it, and then explosives to... The next. So this is where it gets interesting, <laughs> um, and I, I'm very glad that um, Mary was be you know brought that up too. Every time Fora is able to transition a service with the consent of the board to something else, that reduces the overhead cost of operation for Fora. And when it happens like that, and I'm going to use the 2022 because in my estimation that's what's going to happen. Uh, don't know that, but that's just my thought. That means that CFD money and tax money, all those things keep coming in, which means you have more money to determine if you want to do something with Monterey Road or if you want to fund this puppy, which is the HCP, the Habitat Conservation Plan. This is probably one of the most important components of this entire process. And what's interesting about it is the way that the uh, transition plan works is 13 agencies will form a joint powers authority and that joint powers authority would be empowered to manage and implement this plan. 
Now, we've talked a lot about how that money is going to come there. And there was some discussion about, well, we're going to get it from property tax revenue. There's others that we're going to sell property, set up an endowment, and it's going to live off the interest. And then there was also funded through the CFD, right? But I need you to be really thinking about this because this is one that's going to get kind of sticky. First of all, that JPA is going to have to determine who's going to actually sign off on the permits, right? So they're either going to have to contract out staff, hire contractors, uh, sorry, hire staff, hire contractors, you know, work a deal with the county or bring in other people in one of the other member agencies. But someone at the end of the day, that JPA is still going to require to have meetings and have um, a process by which those permits are issued so that we can get through fish and wildlife. Now, when you look at this, um, there's funding for the CFD through 2020 uh, through 2022. So with the projects that are currently proposed in the 2019-2020 CIP, that's a, that's a substantial amount of money and that's the funds that you have set aside at this point. There's currently $16 million that has been set aside for this process or that project to go in over time. Here's where it gets interesting. Um, the board was talking about the possibility of getting building removal bonded and attaching that to some of that property tax revenue. Now there's an upside to that because from an economic standpoint, all these buildings go away, people can start building, it's going to look a lot better, it could get a jump start on economic impacts. The downside is that it's going to tie up those property tax revenues until that bond is retired, which means those funds can no longer be used to fund the HCP, right? So that's a question. So if you go forward with the building removal, one of the questions the board will have to ask is, do you fund it at 100% of the bondable level? or do you go down to 50% or 60% or whatever that might look like to keep some aside for the Habitat Conservation Plan. The other piece, and I don't know, just a quick show of hands, how many of you are involved in other JPAs out there that you know of? Okay, so most of the time there's gonna be a contribution level, right? When you're working with other agencies, each similar to what we have here at Fora, there's a fee that is paid that goes into that. That has to be determined. But one of the things that we found we can't quite nailed down at this point, we can set in the implementing agreements that a JPA will be formed and you agree to become part of it. But you would need a separate agreement between those 13 agencies to establish what the cost is of that plan, what the contribution levels are going to be for the individual agencies, and what, if any, funds might be allocated through FORA. So hypothetically, if after your 2019-2020 CIP, you didn't do any more project projects, you could take those two years and take all of that CFD funds specifically for the HCP. That could be, that could be a choice that you make. That could be your CIP, if you will, for 2020, uh, 20, 2021 and 21-22. But this is gonna become a really important discussion. And again, it'll be in the implementing agreements that you have to sign on to the JPA. But our advice is, you know, let's get busy on getting that JPA structured, projected costs, how it's going to fund, and how it's going to be managed. Because that's going to tell you how much money you're going to need in order to make this happen. So the, again, the HCP also includes a lot of our ex officio um, members. There's 13 altogether, and it is a must. One of the things that's come up through this a couple of times is what happens if one of the agencies just says, you know what, not doing it. Don't want to do it. I'm not going to play. Um, and, and that has happened in some other instances. The way your agreements are set up, any one of the other agencies could sue. Any of our environmental groups here in, in the peninsula could sue. It's, a, it's any type of litigation you can imagine that's possible. There's also a question that I just need to bring up that, you know, the base reuse plan was created, you know, two decades ago, and things change for all of us. So as you go through your own, you're all bid compliant with the base reuse plan at this point. But if you move into another section of your community's growth and you decide to update your general plan and make it different, then you go through the environmental review process, CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, and open that up for discussion to see what impacts you're, you're creating by not doing that. But that, that would all then be on you because FORA is no longer there, right? You are all FORA in your individual jurisdictions post the sunset. But this particular item, I just kind of love to have a brief discussion about it because again, Every single group we've talked to, this is one of the most important things, because this is one we know you have to fund, and we know that not all the agencies are set up to do so. So, Madam Chairman, you want to open up the floor and... Why not? Um, Director Gagliotti. Um, I have a question about that lead, the lead agency. Um, do we th have any idea who that might be? 
Well, that's the thing. A joint powers authority is not a lead agency. Right. It's, it's a JPA. So, so, so each, you'd have to have an agreement, right, that would specify, all right, I'm going to have a joint powers authority. I'm going to have one representative from each of the member agencies. We are going to determine with that group if you hire staff, which is then a PERS issue, or if you contract out. Now, just as an aside, RJS, we're currently working with the Salinas Valley Groundwater JPA. So they don't have staff. You know, we're their staff, and we're not the only folks out there that do that. But you do have to have somebody that sets the meeting agendas, you know, gets the staff report together if it is needed, and basically says, here's the process. And they need the people to sign off on the permit. That, I got that part yeah. of it. The J, that's the JPA yeah. construct. It's the lead agency. It's the purpose of the JPA and the lead agency role. They're the ones who would take the arrows in litigation. So who have we identified? The, the J JPA. Well, the JPA the is J not the lead agency, The though. JPA is the lead agency. Isn't it? Sorry, you're correcting me? Okay, I don't know. So so the, they're the implementing agency. Jonathan's got it. So, okay. There are two lead agencies on the HCP. Oh, that's right. One is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on NEPA, and four is the lead agency on CEQA. So when there's no fora. It, right, there's no fora. So, uh, right, so... The public review period ends. Fora is liable for any lawsuits on CEQA. Uh, the service would be liable on NEPA. This and then use Fish and Wildlife Service. Would that doesn't. Jurisdictions have, wouldn't they have um, any liability if they don't implement? They're, they are, they're likely responsible agencies, but they, they would okay. not have. That's that what I. Problem. Okay. So do, he was saying they're responsible. The JP is the responsible agency, but lead agency would be Fish and Wildlife. Well, under yeah. NEPA, yeah. but not right. CEQA, they would, the, the CEQA would probably then be the JPA. Okay, well, that's a, that's a huge consideration. Yes. Um, and then the second thing is, is that um, what binds then the members, kind of touching on that, what binds the members to join that JPA or, you know, once the JPA is created, like what binds Delray Elks to join that? Well, the, my understanding is, first of all, the JPA, the, the HCP is a mitigation requirement, right? right? So if anybody chooses not to participate exactly. in that mitigation requirement, yeah. they would then be open for suit, either from another agency for non-performance uh, or from an environmental agency or anybody who wanted to sue. Okay. That, yeah, I, I understand the incentive there. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one, the, the, the setup of the JPA and this admin costing, is this something that would be considered would be adding it to the, CF, the CIP for 1920? Well, if we don't change anything Let's say if we, if we just leave everything the way it is now, right. the JPA, hypothetically, let's say it, it takes effect, um, I'm trying to think when, they, or let's say it takes effect in uh, 2020. I don't think you could do it quite that quickly, but if it did, right, then the CFD is a funding mechanism, right? So they basically write a check over to the JPA. The JPA then uses those funds for implementation as it, as it performs those services in the various jurisdictions. No, I'm saying the, the setup of the JPA, the admin, that admin costing, all, putting all that together, that you just, just to create the thing called the JPA. I'm going to defer to Michael on that. Is that something that FORA would um, assist in funding? The setup of the JPA. Well, we've already crafted a joint powers authority agreement. We've already paid for all the legal and how it would need to be structured. We've assumed how it would be staffed either by contract or by staff, what, what it would take to make that happen. Uh, I don't know that we have, you know, assuming that we get an HCP approved, we'd have a very limited time to organize it before four goes away. I wouldn't add much to what limited staff we're going to have. I mean, the idea was to offload this, not to be for a funded or for operated. So um, in terms of organizing it, in terms of the oversight for creating the JPA, that's already been part of our program. So we anticipate that part. How it works after that, I think, would have to be under the JPA's authority. Okay. No, that answered the question. Is it the admin's already set up? Everything's, this thing exists. Okay. Thank you. No, but anyway, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Director Hoffa. So um, I, I would be interested in hearing from the administrative committee about their thoughts and, and their discussion on this. Um, two thoughts that I have. One, I think uh, I have some unease about committing long-term property tax increment, even though I understand the value and importance of the building removal. I don't know if there's a possibility to do it in like a 10-year bond, like if the payoff is quicker, that would make me less uneasy. But if we're talking about committing property tax increment for decades, 
I just think that is something that should all give us pause, at least it gives me pause. I would be more inclined to say, let's share 50% of land sale because we were already kind of, that's already the fora model. So what if that 50% uh, land share now would go towards the JPA? I would be more comfortable with, with that. I'm a, or if it's property tax, I wanna have a shorter window for the payback. Um, but those, those are my thoughts and I'm interested in hearing what the uh, admin committee talked about. All right, Mr. Malin, thank you. Thanks so much, I appreciate the, uh, the, the question and the concern. Uh, the uh, administrative uh, committee has uh, been uh, reviewing the, uh, the potential for uh, building removal and, and how it might spur uh, the redevelopment of the uh, uh, four-door properties. Um, at present, uh, the, the committee, and um, I'm, I'm more than willing to be uh, corrected if I'm wrong, uh, is, is of the uh, consensus, I will say, that committing the uh, maximum um, um, allowable um, future increment to building removal is probably one of the most important things that could occur uh, in the in however long for uh, remains uh, a, a, as an operating entity. Uh, the, the, uh, the building, the blight that has, that has remained for decades uh, eliminates you know, probably you know, 70, 80 percent of the development interest uh, just by being visible and present. And to the extent that um, the buildings can come down sooner rather than later, um, the benefits of redevelopment will happen sooner rather than later. And again, I'm happy to be corrected by any of my colleagues. Thank you, and I, yes, uh, Mr. Long. I think Craig uh, definitely articulated how the admin committee was we're unanimous on, on our opinion of that. One of the things that we had tossed out, uh, possibly that uh, Kendall uh, RGS could look at, would be uh, a nexus funding. So look at um, uh, potentially you know, the cost benefit of the different participants of the HCP and put together some type of nexus funding uh, that would establish your proportionate um, uh, sharing cost of that. And currently that is not within their scope of their work, but that was something that we tossed out that potentially we would be interested in them looking at. And that would be, that's now talking about the HCP and how to fund it? Correct, correct. Uh-huh, and, um, okay, interesting. Any other um, thoughts from the admin committee on the HCP and how it would be funded? Um, okay, uh, you had something else though, Mr. Uslar. Just briefly about the building removal, I would just ask the board to, to keep an open mind when the numbers come back to you because you will see that the actually uh, impact for the county uh, property taxes that will be used to fund the building removal is, uh, is of course important, Nick, but it's, uh, it's, it's very, 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 very small in the big budget of the county. So, so I'm just saying, please keep an open mind when the numbers come back because we feel very much committed to, to building removal as, uh, as part of making this, uh, the area uh, attractive for potential new developers coming. Okay, um, Director Oglesby. I, I would ask the board to ask the admin to, to, to firm up their, their thoughts and what they're recommending to the board. I'm, tr I'm trying to get clued in on what you guys agreed to and we need to know how, how strong you feel about that and what is the ultimate answer because some of these answers should come from, from you. And, and then, you know, we look to adopt some of those concerns. But, you know, building removal is very important. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if whether it takes 40 years to pay the tax increment back or not is, is worth it, but I think, it's, I think it goes without saying leaving those buildings up is worse than paying it back over 30 years. I, I just can't imagine leaving those buildings up. And we all know how 50% of development fees, how much money comes in for that, and when it's not coming in, the building stays up. So I would just add the admin to give us some more background on that. 
I think if I may, um, the uh, consultant team that's working on that NHA advisors were going to report back to the admin, and the only reason that we, they don't have that information is because it wasn't provided quite yet, but I believe that's going to be coming up at either the next admin or very soon after, and the specific question was looking at that that correlation between increase in economic development opportunities and, and what might look like for tax revenue down the road, as opposed to if you leave them there, I think, not to put food, find a point on it, but everybody kind of said, without these buildings, we've got so much more potential. The longer the buildings sit there, the worse it's going to be, so. You know, the scope of this has been a tremendous question for the full time that I've been executive officer. We've we're near 80 percent of building removal now. In fact, we just finished our first phase in Seaside, uh, surplus two, but about 80 percent, but there's still the 20 percent that remain are right where folks see it and has a significant impact and a detrimental effect on the interest of certain developers. I think the, exec, the administrative committee has clearly understood the potential for increasing property values as you eliminate the barriers to development. Mm -hmm. So that comes back to the jurisdictions as real dollars post for So the, the idea of getting funding in place for the building removal has been important. This is an election. This is not a for a requirement in the beginning, but it's clearly a reuse requirement for the next steps. So we've been talking a lot about building removal. I think on the HCP, you uh, and I guess there's competition for funds, which is why we got there. But I think it might be helpful to, um, if there's a, f I mean, it's a little bit interactive, but part of what you, you were talking about here was some options for getting the HCP fully funded. And it seems to me that um, if we, if we know what we have in the bank now and how much we need and we can get an idea of how much money is coming into FORA now through property tax, what is the projected, um, sure. you know, g get some ideas of if we did it this way, we could use CFD, this much of CFD money. You know, it's not going to be all of one thing or another right. because there's so many demands. But if we had some options for what we could um, siphon off here and there and what we'd be choosing for and against, um, you know, it, it might be helpful. Because yeah. it's, I think, w as humans, are, we tend to think, oh, it's going to be this. Well, I think and there was we don't people have that, that option. There was money that was just floating from right. points beyond. But I think, you know, from, from our standpoint, the recommendation would be that, um, while well, it's not in our scope now, but we certainly could do it, is to set up a pro forma that says, okay, this is the expected cost of implementation. These are the various sources of funding. You know, based on, I think what Lane was saying, is based on the number of jurisdictions, number of acreage, this would be a reasonable um, contribution for each of those agencies about what they'd have to put into it. And then you have something to react to at the board level because that will inform your other decisions. So if we know, for example, that the building removal is going to increase property values for sure, right, because you don't have to. Do so that plays into the discussion as well. But there's a lot of moving parts. And I think we're just saying that from what we can see, we, we believe that that's something you need to decide sooner rather than later because it is going to be such an important part of the transition. And the nexus would be based on a jurisdiction's need for habitat uh, to compensate for development, not so much, I'm thinking, as yeah. the county now, uh, we have a lot of habitat land to manage. Uh, not all of it uh, is because we needed it to offset right. our particular development. So, so a lot of that will also be informed by the environmental document, which um, Jonathan and I were just talking about, is, is going to be out. Um, soon, so we'll know what the requirements are and what, what the costs are going to be. But I think you're going to need to have that before the board, so you can, and especially before that 13 member JPA with all those members, so that they kind of know what they're getting into. Because those decisions, you need to know what you're buying before FORA goes to sleep, right? You want to know what your commitment is, otherwise, you're not going to be prepared to implement. Right. And I think it'd be helpful if there's a way that there is existing or soon arriving for a funding that could help build yeah. up the endowment, it then frees up money for the jurisdictions later that they don't have to figure out in the implementing agreements uh, or you know commit to in advance or however that exactly. might happen. So, uh, Director Morton, did you have something you wanted I, to I did. Say? Uh, it's just the for a blight removal that currently there is no funding beyond just two commitments, the one I think is completed with the city of Seaside and taking down the stockade, that the 
funding structure that cre FORA created does not allocate any funds for blight removal. And it's very, well, everybody understands, CFD money that we're collecting cannot be used for blight removal. So I think the admin committee was creative and said all of us as jurisdictions are straddled with this crippling blight and we have no funding mechanism and the removal of blight often exceeds the value of the land that we need help with. So this tax increment and in bonding that became the creative strategy of trying to help all of us. If, in fact, we divert it to habitat, then we don't have it for blight. So, but I want to go to what this habitat. Habitat, we, we created a CFD and included habitat in that because habitat did not have a nexus if you're doing a base-wide permit. And so the board set a policy that 30% of every 24,000 gets set aside for putting into habitat. And all of us going forward in jurisdictions can continue to agree to some mechanism that if we pull a permit that we're still going to fund or contribute the 7,200 is what it is currently to fund our commitments for the habitat in a JPA. It's just not paid to FORA. FORA is holding this 16 million. As we're going through this, Kendall, and we're saying water is going to MCWD, that we're peeling off the regional roads. I don't know what that is. Uh, Director Hoffa said it was 50 million, but whatever that is, that we're peeling that off is in these next two years, if we're reducing our responsibilities of what's in the CIP, shouldn't we consider as a model to weigh and consider is the 24,000 that's collected going forward between now and 2020 or 2022, not using the totality of that or 20,000 of it or something more to get us that we have adequate funding or we're well on our way for funding the habitat, that it would seem that that would be a focus as opposed to biting the baby in half about our tax increment. So I would like to, us to consider that as well. And that's what I'm trying to also struggle with is um, if TAMSI takes this, MCWD takes this, really what are we looking at? What's, what's left? We have 24,000. We have our projections going forward, 24,000 times whatever those projections are. I think it was well, 6.8 million mm -hmm. for 1920 was our projected revenues was in that area, is how much of that should go to habitat. And, and that's, I, I'm waiting to get into the grit, and we're still on theory. Well, I think that's, that's, that's where I'm going with this. If, that you need to know what the cost is for implementation, and from a policy decision, you need to decide. Because if, if we are, if the board gives us direction that implements what we've talked about, moving water, moving transportation, moving local, moving all those things off, then your only real remaining piece is the CFD. And if all the funds then moving in that two-year period between 2020 and 2022, that's a lot of money. And then coupled with the 16 million that would shift over to that and with potentially some land use revenues, now you're talking about a different structure. But you board, the board and the 13, you need to know what it's going to cost how much potential revenue there is out there, the sources of those revenue and funding mechanisms, and then be able to make that call. So, I, I agree. But the only thing that in your statement yeah. just currently, yeah. board policy is land sale revenues goes to blight removal. And I'm not sure we want to change that between now and 2022. That, that's, that's, I just yeah. point that yeah. out. It's yeah. a board policy decision. Uh, Director Hoffa. Okay, so I'm just trying to imagine beyond 2020 or 2022, whichever it happens to be. So what I'm hearing is the administrative committee feels like the value of blight removal is such that we should commit property tax increment to that. Okay, I'm fine with that. But then that's a future funding source for the habitat and transportation that we won't have. Okay, so then what we have left is future CFD 
for future development, and land sales. And I'm just wondering if at the, at the transition point, it wouldn't make sense, and I'd be curious to know if we have an estimate of how much future land sales might be, but um, the future development is, is what will require the habitat and the permits. And so as those projects are developed and, and land is sold, then if a certain percentage of that land sale went to the Habitat JPA, it seems like that would make sense. Because at that point, oh, I need my permit or I need to, I need to mitigate my project. So that, I'm just wondering if, if that makes sense. And, and then the CFD, future CFD, maybe goes to transportation and transit. Mr. Lane. My understanding of the legislation as written, <clears throat> there's no future CFD. After 2022, CFD. But even for new projects? I mean, at that point. Correct. Oh. The CFD terminates in 2022, which is why I think the importance of, of this discussion of what are your priority projects, because that revenue source ends in 2022. Same with, with property tax, that revenue source ends unless, unless the, there's a bond that obligates that prior to that. But it would be a, it would be a, a, a locally imposed fee. There would still be fees, C right? Correct. It okay. gives the ability for local jurisdictions to implement. But that's other, what other I'm, I'm, I guess I'm imagining that the, that the, the nexus study with that TAMC would do each jurisdiction would then pay their nexus obligation possibly through through the funding they would get from their local impact fee. C correct. I, I think that's part of the discussion that we'd like to have with RGS is what's the pr appropriate nexus to have um, in, in establishing that so that we don't, as a JPA, once it's formed, you kind of know what those rules and the nexus for the funding will be. But are, are there any, uh, what, what is the argument against committing some portion of future land sales to fund the Habitat JPA? Is, is there sort of a consensus on that? Or are there concerns well, about I, that? I would have, that would change the construct of what had been assumed for the last couple of decades, which is that the land sales revenue is only split 50-50 between base-wide and jurisdictional issues through the life of fora. So that would mean making a, a commitment that future land sales, again, jurisdictions that would keep half, split the other half for the purposes you're talking about. That's what would be required. Or it could be a different percentage because there's no requirement anymore. The city would still be receiving the land sale proceeds and could decide to dedicate it all or some portion of it to habitat or anything else I think is that kind of what you're trying to get at I, I think yeah that there okay. should be an appropriate percentage of that that would go towards habitat because you're going to need the habitat for that new development right and that would be up to the cities as their I think it would be up yeah I think the well, mayor's the JPA would right. need to determine what again what is the appropriate obligation I suppose based on the size and the mitigation needs mm -hmm. Mr. Holm and then Director Morton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as we're talking about the, uh, the HCP, I think an important part of the conversation is whether or not we think, um, and maybe forest staff can answer, where we are with the kind of the stay ahead provision versus having to fund the whole thing um, that, you know, because the HCP was based on the total amount of land that was identified for economic development where if that, do, that development doesn't occur um, the way it was originally scoped was that we would still have to mitigate for, even if, if that development didn't occur. But if the development doesn't occur, then that lowers what that cost is for, for that mitigation. I think Jonathan can take this on more detail than I can. We are ahead currently. Our development does not exceed what our take would be. So we're in pretty good shape. And currently, most of our areas where take would occur, we've not moved into those areas, only with roads and certain things. The City of Marina recently found out um, with the new forest of San Gilia that they have out at the airport that this is rapidly becoming an issue, however. 
that um, it's going to be quite a difficult time to be able to develop without an HCP given the amount of new species that are developing. Jonathan, we are very far ahead, but what happens um, if we were to develop another 20 percent of Fort Ord? So, so the way the state head provision um, is draft, currently drafted is that um, preservation always stays ahead by 5 percent uh, of, of take. So um, say there's 1,000 acres of, of uh, required preservation of San Gilia in the habitat reserves. Then um, say there was, uh, I don't know, 500 acres of take allowed in development parcels. The percentage would always have to stay ahead. So you'd have to, if you needed to take um, 400, or all 500 acres, or let's just say you need half that, you need 250 acres of the 500 allowed take acres, then you would have to preserve um, 500, 5% 5 would be 550 acres in, in the habitat reserves. But it also includes funding. So you would need, you would need the funding for that um, to be in place to manage those 550 acres. So that's how it's written, that you don't have to fund all that 1,000 acres on day one, just the amount of take that you've, you're um, already generating um, take permits for which the JPA issues out um, certificates of inclusion to, to development to include them in those take permits. Mm -hmm. um, the 13 agencies in the potential JPA for the Habitat Conservation Plan, do they all have land? Yes, I believe they do. They do. Mm -hmm. Because I know, for example, the colleges. Okay, let yeah, me ask yeah. this again. Are they all going to have land sale proceeds? No. 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 So I, that's I'm now getting to where I want to go, is that the whole point of the HCP is to make sure it's an equitable allocation of the cost, based on what development you do within your jurisdiction. So by how Fora set it up and tying it to the CFD. It was designed to be pay-as-you-go, to your point, and allowed you to stay ahead. And what it was is we had a set amount. It's 30 percent of currently 7,200, and it's a certain percent for commercial development. So to strap anybody that you're going to put your land sale revenues in, but you actually never get to that development, is also inequitable. And so I would urge us to continue to consider that we have a fee which gets adjusted in the CIP, there's an adjustment schedule for inflation, is that whatever that is, the city of Marina would continue to commit that every residential permit that we pull going forward after Fora sunsets, once this HCP in, is created, is that we're going to continue to pay that. And whatever our commercial development, and Seaside do the same. And the point in that is, that you don't want to burden anybody. Seaside, you're going through a land sale. You do it January uh, 2023, and you put in a set percentage of your land. I never do any more development in the city of Marina. Now you're overly burdened. So I really want people to think about that as you're structuring this and really look at what we've done is might be the exact same thing. We just agree what those fees are going to be per unit because it only gets imposed if we develop. Just to clarify, not, not tying HCP funding to land sales, but tying it to impact. Tying it to permit pool, permit. actual development. Right. The, the distinction is that the HCP doesn't have, is not an impact fee, and we can't impose impact fees. Okay. But the distinction is that we all agree we're going to exactly. pay a Exactly. It's a pay-to-play. Pay, got it. Pay-to-play. I go. understand that. And I just want to say that makes a lot of sense. I, I was not aware that some of the members would not be, have land sales to contribute. So those that do, I mean, they can use their some portion of that to pay their fee. Those that don't will have to find some other way to come up with a way to pay their fee. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. To quickly add, both MPC and CSUMB have paid in. 
UCSC as well has agreed that development on their parcels would contribute equally to the way that the jurisdiction's developments do. So just to be clear, it's not that they, it's the land sales part. But in terms of fees, they're paying their obligations. Okay, are we feeling uh, good about HCP discussion? Anything else? Anything else you need from us? Well, what I'm going to say is that in the next steps, I'm going to walk you through some of these agreements really quickly and then give it back to Jonathan. But I want to point out that when we come back before you again, we're likely going to have this ver this very large implementing agreement with decision points. So it'll probably be actionable items like A, B, C. So we agree on this for water. We agree on this for um, local projects, on this for regional, all those different things that we can click off and get a board action on, right? Um, but then, as we go through that, as I mentioned, you'll all have these in your implementing agreements. Marina Coast will have their own agreements. Then there'll be implementing agreements from the Army to Seaside and then to the agencies, including um, the Veterans Cemetery, MPC, and M UCM, uh, Monterey Bay. Um, so those all happen, and then the hope here is that if everyone's comfortable with it, that all those things then transition over to other agencies so that FORA is really left with, you know, just collecting the CFD and then kind of based on the conversation today that we would memorialize that so that funds would flow through to the JPA, whatever that might be called, um, and that, that those funds would then be used for the HCP. So there'll be some other decision points that come up regarding, again, building removal. I think that'll be here before you soon. But um, this gives us a good sense of sort of where the board's at. There are some additional items that will be in the implementing agreements that are also required as part of the Brace for Use Plan. Um, as an example, um, if there is a land sale, there's a requirement to report back on economic impact for seven years um, once the sale has taken place. That report goes back to the Army. We'll put that information in there. So if your city or agency has selling something, you'll be required to do that. There's only just a few of those left that, that would qualify for this. We'll also likely have a tick for the board to discuss any additional funding or what they might want to do for uh, Veterans Coast Cemetery, if there's you know any parting gifts that you would like to give. Um, also trying to figure out if there's any um, economic things that you would like to incorporate into your implementing agreements. You know, commitments to, you know, meeting quarterly to discuss regional economic um, uh, issues within the peninsula, these sort of things. But they're not necessarily requirements of the implementation plan as they're there, but we just want to make sure that they're super fleshed out. So again, at the end, um, the, this, if all this happens, your CIP process for 2020, 2021, and possibly 21, 22 is much smaller. I think you can all see that that will, will definitely change. So I appreciate so much your willingness to chat about this. I'm going to turn this back over to Jonathan for the wrap up. But before I do that, does anybody have any other questions or comments you want to get to us before we start typing away? I, my comment is, it seems to me like we're really close. I mean, I, what I'm hearing is there's a lot of consensus. So um, I'm feeling optimistic, and um, I'm hopeful that we can get these agreement, implementing agreements done as soon as possible. The only thing that I feel is lacking, and I've said this for a long time, is like the vision of what is it going to look like at the end of all of this. What is this space going to look like? Where the, what are the buildings going to be? What is the whole thing going to look like? And I, I don't feel like there's any mechanism that we have to help shape that. So that's, that remains lingering in my mind. So, um, uh, Dr. Samuels and then uh, Mr. Pick. I think that uh, the university's perspective on this is what it looks like now and what it won't look like, which is... <laughs> which is something that our, our, our chairperson has dealt with for many years uh, as her scenery surrounding her office. Um, Mr. Hulamard and his crew have dealt with for many years, um, and the university certainly has dealt with for many years and grown up amidst uh, a lot of blight that needs to be gone in order for us to be able to move forward with certain aspects of our mission. So we we consider very, very appropriately your idea of a vision of what it will look like, 
But I think our issue right now is, is what it looks like now and what it won't look like if, if the blight removal takes place. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to reinforce what um, uh, Director Hoffa mentioned, and that is uh, I think the admin committee broadly feels that great progress is being made um, in, in no small part thanks to uh, the consultant team. Uh, they're not all created equally, and, and uh, Kendall and, uh, and Steve are doing great work. Um, I know they've, they've met with, with my municipality two or three times and multiply that by the jurisdictions. They're really getting around and doing a lot of spade work. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, oh, Mr. Hulamar, did you have something you wanted to say? No, just there were several comments today about uh, things that RGS can help us with. We have to be careful because their contract has some rather specific things that they're required to do, but uh, we may be have to may come back to you with some amendments. Uh, some of the things that uh, had talked about weren't there, and we do have a new funding year coming up, and maybe we need to consider that when the budget gets reviewed. Uh, how do we address some of these other things? Or either someone's got to take a back look at those. That was my follow-up question, is there were several things that's beyond the scope of RGS that seem like because of their base knowledge, the work that they've done, they would, we should add some things to the scope of their contract, and I would hope, I doubt it can happen by Friday, but I would hope that it would come next week, next month. Great. Yeah, Director Cagliotti and then uh, Director Oglesby. Um, it, it's just building on what um, Director Morton just said, and you kind of brought up, is that it would be nice to have that pro forma, is to kind of set up to kind of uh, um, what things cost and give us some options with numbers. I'm glad Director Adams talked about the vision of what it would look like once we're, we're gone. And I know it's one thing that we don't want it to look like. And I think after 24, 25 years, we don't want blight to be standing here. I mean, if we want to make a statement on the way out the door, you know, it doesn't have to be overly developed. We don't have to have a lot. That, but if we leave here and we just leave the buildings that were built in 52, 68, you know, that's, that's on us. And so the, the formula for blight removal, we, we use that for 24 years and we see what happened to us by using that. It takes land sales development, and I know it's in the legislation, but I'm talking about on the way out the door, we can change some of these things, and we should try to change that one in particular. So I just don't want that to be forgotten. Uh, you know, the uh, admin go back and have, the com have a conversation among themselves. Just don't go back to the regular old formula. Uh, Great. Well, I think it's been a good discussion, and I appreciate um, us being able to have this conversation with the admin committee members present and all the work that they've been doing because when when I w was reading some of the just the notes from those discussions it looked like as director Hoffa said that that there's quite a bit of agreement and so um, that's different than what it feels like sometimes in our board meetings. So it's very <laughs> useful to um, to see what the people who've been really looking at the issues and uh, arguing it out between the jurisdictions and really trying to figure out how to make things work, um, that, that there has been so much discussed and worked through and, a f you know, a fair amount of, of agreement and an idea of some paths forward so that the questions we're asking are um, refinements and what about options and um, instead of having to worry about the heavy lifting of the boulders because the admin committee already did that for us so really appreciate that I guess I'll just um, see before we um, before we hand it back to Jonathan if there's any member of the public who wants to comment on any of the um, topics um, and uh, any of the discussion, if there are any questions or comments you'd like to make at this point. Okay, seeing no one coming forward, um, I hand it back to, to you all. Okay, so we promised you a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, here's a graphic that gets us close to a side-by-side -side comparison. So we're talking about for CIP, we want to um, just recognize the Army Cleanup ESCA is not part of the four CIP, but just the general concept here is four has a CIP, includes those three items, transportation, habitat, conservation plan funding, and, and water augmentation funding. So what, where the transition plan fits in on the comparison side is 
those CIP items are going over to other agencies who have CIPs. And the graphic, we don't have the room to show all the jurisdictions and their individual CIPs with the local roads, but, you know, TAMC uh, does the regional roads. Um, a future JPA is being, um, part, being proposed as part of the Habitat Conservation Plan. Marina Coast Water District has a CIP, and so, so that's just the general concept of movement of, from one CIP that was, is for us to other agencies that have CIPs. Okay, so just a quick summary on each of those in a little more detail is just um, where we've been in discussions with the administrative committee and others and um, on the transportation side, uh, the, the shovel ready projects, uh, four would complete those by 2020 or fully fund those. That's what's been being proposed and, uh, by the jurisdictions and the administrative committee. And then transfer the on-site improvements. So just as FORA has flexibility on the on-site projects and we do the, the monitoring with TAMC, the jurisdictions would still have that flexibility taking on these on-site projects. Similarly for TAMC, as Debbie mentioned, they update their regional development impact fee. I think it's every five years. So they have that flexibility to adjust those off-site and regional projects um, should they adopt those as into their fee program. And this is just that the map of the TAMC fee program. They have studied the four zone, the blue zone there as part of their 2018 development impact fee. Um, so that's just pointing out that that, ha that potential handout, handoff is um, been studied and there's a fee set up for the four zone. Um, on the water augmentation, uh, Marina Coast Water District, um, working with FOR now that the annexation is moving ahead, um, they, they also have a study underway uh, for that second water augmentation project in addition to the RUOP recycle project. Um, part of that study will result in hopefully identifying that augmentation project and then once that project's identified and there's a relative cost um, for that project built up, Marina Coast could incorporate that into their capital improvement program. Their capacity charges are collected on future development to fulfill their, their um, CIP. And then on the Habitat Conservation Plan side, we have the, the stru uh, structure of the HCP includes a uh, JPA board. Um, that board would have discretion how they want to provide staffing. And then um, the post-funding sources we have identified in this meeting, that needs to be identified post fora for the JPA board. So that's the, the end of this um, presentation. Thank you. And with that, we have come to the end of our agenda. So if there's nothing else for the good of the order, um, I see you leaning towards your microphone, Mr. Hulmard. So what, just, uh, I, 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 this one, uh, less than a minute. So a lot of this is going to help to inform the deliberations that have to occur at the next meeting and then maybe the following meeting. Also, it's, it's intended that uh, to recognize these broad scope of things. We didn't get into every little detail today, including little things like the regulators are also going to have to agree on who the successor to four is, for example, or things like we also have to deal with OEA's concerns about who they're going to designate as the local reuse authority for new dollars that are coming in. There are two or three entities that potentially could get money from OEA in future years, uh, two or three projects that would serve us here, but they're only going to recognize one. There are a few things that we have to kind of wrestle through. That will come up later, and I don't want anybody to think we gave you 100 percent today. But we've get, given you most of what we thought would be helpful to some of the new folks like Director Gagliotti, Director Wizard, who hadn't been through this process with us before, but also to kind of give a refresher to all the board members that this CIP has been central to everything that we do, including the budgets that you're going to be seeing in the next couple of weeks. We're looking forward to ongoing deliberation, and I want to just share with you when I, um, a year or so ago, I commented about you don't know what you don't know. Well, we'll there are five or six things that occurred today where there's some risk that you're going to find out something you don't know in the process. So it will do everything we can to get things through early. But, you know, if we had a target of May or June of next year, it means we have very little time to get this done. So I just want to keep that at every, the forefront of everybody's mind. And that's all I wanted to say, Chair. Thank you. And speaking of which, I wonder, Kendall, if we could circle back. There was some um, concern expressed 
uh, earlier about sort of how all this discussion of CIP and those priorities fits with the transition plan implementing agreements. Could you remind me, it sounded as though sort of a, a template was going to come to the board that somehow we were going to approve or something? Are you and talking about the CIP now or the, or the implementing agreements? Implementing agreements. Okay, implementing agreements are gonna go first to the admin committee um, so we can kind of vet through them. And then once we have all their comments, then as I was mentioning earlier, we'll bring that to the board and there'll be a couple of choice points on there. You know, like I was discussing, like as of you know June 30th, 2020 or June 30th, 2022. So you'll have an opportunity to agree line by line on some of those things so we can get them right. And then as Michael said, that there's also some additional language that are requirements and opportunities. And those, are, we don't have a lot of flexibility on some of that information, but it'll all be in there. Our goal, um, based on what we got at this meeting, is to actually have that draft ready for our friends at admin within a week or two, because we've, we've been compiling as we've been going with, again, some like either or moments in there so they can take a look at it. But I don't see any reason why we couldn't, um, with the exec director's um, guidance, we couldn't get back in front of you in June to have those, uh, to walk through those high, high points on those and see what's missing. And then once we have uh, done that, mm -hmm. then the implementing, <coughs> excuse me, the implementing agreements would essentially be ready to go to the individual jurisdictions to start working out. Yeah, there's their a second trigger point in that. Um, the legislation is actually moving quite well through um, the state right now. Once the legislation, we know it's locked in, there's language in that legislation that specifically affects the implementing agreements with regard to some of the uh, some of the activities that that particularly the County of Monterey will take on afterwards. So as soon as that's done, then we're ready, after we've got all the board input, then we're ready to give a, a semi-final draft to the um, cities and the county for them to review and make their changes. We think that'll likely you know, get us through the fall so that basically by the time everybody's had a chance to make their revisions, we should be pretty good for either early, you know, November, December kind of thing. And I think, you know, I think to what um, Dina was saying, we're seeing a lot more agreement than I think when we first got here. Um, and I don't think that it necessarily people didn't agree. I think that now that we've had a chance to sort of talk all these things out, they've evolved. And it's been a really, your admin committee does a great job of playing devil's advocate and you know taking different positions and really vetting some stuff out in a very professional and cordial and collegial kind of way. And I think having more of those discussions really has made it easier for us to get to this point today so that we know where we're going. So what you're saying is that the the like the 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 larger pieces that the jurisdictions will need to look at in the implementing agreements will be known and can be being discussed while we wait for whatever the legislation yep. does about what the county's responsibilities right. are. So there's right now there's very, again specific paragraphs in that that we would literally lift from the legislation. But if that legislation changes for whatever reason, then we have to swap it out. But it won't be anything, in my opinion, it won't be anything that's Major. like a deal breaker one way or the other. We, the most important thing for us is making sure you look at the projects that you are agreeing to take control of in your jurisdictions, um, agreeing to when uh, TAMSI will move those things over, and then, frankly, agreements between MCWD and TAMSI with some of the things they've talked about in terms of the way they're going to deliver services and or projects. We just want to make sure all of it's out there so everybody can see everybody's deal, and it's completely transparent. Thank you, Mr. Pick, and then Director Morton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to clarify um, Council Member Wizard's question, or answer to his question, the, uh, the admin committee uh, reviewed the 1920 CIP list and uh, is recommending it to the board for, for action. Separately from that, so that it can comport with your budget approval timeline as well. Uh, separate from that, we're doing everything that uh, um, Kendall just described in terms of transition planning as well. Thank you. So my question is, just to that point, is that if, in fact, after this discussion, there seems to be a consensus, I get we didn't take a vote, of moving the water augmentation, the water to MCWD, moving regional road obligations, to TAMSI, the jurisdictions taking responsibility for their local roads, would the admin committee that makes the recommendation on the CIP be considering 
a CIP that says we're going to finish South Boundary Road, we're going to finish the General Jim Moore interchange, and if these things are coming off, what's next is of more of that 24000 per CFD fee would go into allocated for habitat management. Uh, my question is, is that going to be considered by the admin because maybe that's what our CIP should be looking like in 1920, 2021, as we go forward. So the, the admin looked at those recommendations. I think what Dino just said is there's a recommendation coming forward to you that the admin had a uniform approach to, and they're also saying that we can't make it, that we're leaving these two out until we have the information that the study would provide on how we would address those items. And that's what they've provided to you. How does the study address the Habitat Conservation Plan? I, I'm not sure what it, study you're referring would, it, to. So, Stephen. I think what the Administrative Committee is saying is that the existing dollars that are available are recommended to you for Friday's meeting. So there's no new money coming in, but that there is opportunity to look at post 2020 in the way that's being described. Yeah, I think the thing we were, which we, our discussion happened at admin, we have a 2019-2020 proposal for you, right? That, that's gonna go forward. There will be another CIP in 2020, 2021, and 21 to 22. And in that time frame, your admin committee would then come back and look at those alternatives. But I think for, the, for this time, what they've discussed after the ranking and everything that staff put together, that those were the projects they feel are best likely suited for this fiscal year coming up. And then they'd go back and review it again in the next fiscal year. Yeah. So just an idea to put out there for people to think about before we do settle on the CIP. But again, we know we don't have enough money for everything. We know there are a number of regional project, uh, transportation projects we all agree on, I think most of us agree on, um, like the Highway 1. And then there are other projects we don't all agree on, like I'm just going to call it the uh, East Side Parkway or the Southeast, Northwest. I get it mixed up. It's just that's a confusing name. <laughs> Horrible name. <laughs> but uh, we don't all agree on that. We know we don't have enough money. But I wonder if just a compromise that might help move us forward is what if we were to look at funding connecting where eucalyptus now ends, which is kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's a road to nowhere at this point. But what if we were to connect that to giggling and improve giggling? And then the rest of it will be a decision for the county or whatever jurisdiction it's in or TAMC to figure out in the future. Um, it doesn't make any sense to kind of have eucalyptus ending where it ends. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, at this point, it's not a serviceable road. Um, so that's just the thought to put out there. We know we don't, I don't believe we have 20 million to complete that whole project. And I don't believe that would probably be a priority of the whole region, whereas we know there are other priorities. Jonathan, isn't that already part of the scope of the transportation study? Yeah. Mr. Lane. I just want to clarify, when the admin committee, we just kind of looked at, at the priorities. and um, But your question is, you know, we've never, because it's board policy, we've never been asked to look at um, the CIP and say, do we want to allocate it towards HCP? Do we want to allocate it for, towards other uses? So that's a different story. And if the board would like us to do that, we'd certainly, you can direct us to do that because we have not looked at that yet. I think That's that would be helpful. <laughs> We're not taking any votes today, so, you know, we had to be careful about they just said the recommendation is on the agenda for Friday. So, but I, I support the concept, but I think we need to take it step by step, which is do the CIP. We are supposed to be waiting for the study. And if we want to change the policy, let's just change the policy. But, uh, you know, we have time to do that. You know, I, I, I never agreed that this CIP was supposed to be the one we sign off on before we leave. You know, if we're policy makers, then we could change the policy. Good. 
Well, I think we've raised some, some good food for thought, and we have time to chew on it some more at another, at another point. Good. Well, thanks, everybody, for your participation. And with that, we are adjourned.